ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying time is here. That's right, it's a Halloween edition of Terror Train on Kill by Kill. It's already going down. Hey, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from the wilds of Canada somewhere along a rail line. It is the Kill by Kill podcast, where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. And so we're going to unpack all the gory details of the 1981 Canuxploitation classic terror train in the hopes that a medical school... Not graduate, undergraduate. Uh, anyways, if their death, uh, it, they're untimely, and hopefully uh, lets us make a lot of jokes about them. And here, thankfully, to help us in our time of need is the only person that I want to run the rails with. It's the one and only Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing, Gina? Um, I'm good, Patrick. You know, this this movie comes at a perfect time for me because I, I was just thinking recently that as much as I enjoy the, the slasher movie genre, what it really lacks is magic tricks. There are very few Vegas-style showstoppers in, in, uh, in modern horror films or in classic 80s slashers. Yeah, there's no, there's a, there's a distinct lack of card tricks, of sticking a cigarette through a coin. Uh, it's just, there's just been, it's missed so much that there's been a hole somewhere. And, and this movie, God bless, it, it fills that space. It really, really does in a very awkward, stilted and heavily make up way. The good news, though, Gina, is that we are not alone as we travel these uh, rails of rampage. The alliteration just flows out from me. It's not like I'm not a professional writer. The good news is that uh, the host of Fun Dip and Cherry Coke is with us today, the one and only Kira Gowan. How are you doing, Kira? Hello, I'm doing good. Well, I'm I'm very hot, uh, yeah. as I think we all are. It's uh, unseasonably warm this time of year, for sure. We are sweating buckets. <laughs> it has, uh, it's summer part three here <sighs> in Southern California. Yes, the, uh, the, the real horror here is climate change. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And so if we, if you feel the sweat coming through the podcast, know that we're suffering for our heart <laughs> and for you. Uh, so as is tradition here on the Kill by Kill podcast, we always like to ask our guests where the first time they came in contact with the movie is. And so, Kira, where did you come across Terror Train for the first time? Um, when you suggested that we do it for this podcast, I had never heard of it, although I'm familiar with Jamie Lee Curtis, I guess is probably the only actor in here that I uh, recognized. But yeah, this uh, this podcast was the first time I've ever um, seen it. Uh, one thing about me is it's kind of embarrassing. I host a podcast about movies, but I haven't really seen that many. So almost anything you suggested would have been new to me. <laughs> yeah, that's really okay. No one's asking <laughs> you to be an expert here. That's true. Uh, that's and the, the point of my podcast is to fill in the gaps. So so Paratrain uh, was one of uh, Jamie Lee's uh, string of films that she did after the success of Halloween. Her and her management team sought out uh, deals where she could be the star uh, in various vehicles. First came Prom Night and Terror Train followed soon after. It, this was also filmed in Canada. It is also filled with disco. <laughs> um. <laughs> it is also filled with... with, with uh, padded out scenes uh, such as in uh, in prom night it was a extended disco dancing sequence in terror train it's uh, again uh, we're gonna keep mentioning a magic show there's a lot of magic tricks <laughs> in this in, in in as part of a not terribly convincing red herring but uh yeah there's a lot of lot of magic a lot of sleight of hand and after a while i i too was like tended to react to it like one of the characters in the movie just a look of scorn yeah yeah <laughs> Not only do we get to see lots of magic, we get to see someone fail at heckling magic. <laughs> Which, I mean, at one point, you don't know who to hate more, and then you're supposed to root for the magician in a situation, and I'm like, this is a bridge too far. 
if it's him or the teens, like I was kind of on his his side for most of it. They were the teens were super drunk and obnoxious the whole time. I, I feel like are we kind of building up to a sort of like spoiler or or stunt casting as to who the magician is? I mean, I wasn't gonna say it because it's it was like so spectacular, like when it shows it, up in the it, credits. It's bi- but... it's bizarre. It's, <laughs> Pat, Patrick, could I could I could I spoil it for the listener? Oh, please! It's David Cop. It's David Copperfield. <laughs> It's David like, Copperfield, which is just like I, I, he's not playing himself. I mean, of of course he he is, but but I am pretty. He's not not playing. Himself I, I, either. I am pretty sure. This yeah, is, he's just David Copperfield as the magician. Yeah, that's. I think that's literally how he's credited is the magician, and the movie sort of sets him up as a potential love interest for Jamie Lee Curtis's character, and they have a a staggering lack of chemistry. It's it's it's. <laughs> It's like there's not enough spark between the two of them to to light a can of Sterno. It's just, <laughs> it's just like watching somebody make make conversation with their cousin in a family reunion. There's just nothing there, not not a thing. And and I am pretty sure this is his only acting role. I, I could be wrong. <laughs> I, I I may need to go to the Wikipedia's for that. But uh, but go ahead, Patrick, and uh, continue setting up the uh, the plot for this. Yeah, as you as you said, there's not a lot of chemistry here, but the movie wants to tell us that romance is in the air. And then these two manage to put a large fan nearby so that it clears all the romance out of the way. <laughs> We're just left with them awkwardly flirting with one another. But before all of that happens, before we actually board said terror train, we have our setup. Every the thing that the rest of the movie depends upon to give it fuel this is the inciting incident and it happens like most of these movies do with jamie lee curtis and her required by law two girlfriends flanking her (laughs) um, as they talk and we don't get to hear what they're saying uh, at a frat uh, mixer i suppose Um, a new year's eve bonfire which yeah. I think is a strong way to start a movie. Any movie that starts with a bonfire, I'm I'm pretty much I'm there for it. <laughs> Usually it's um, like a campfire, but but I'm there. Well, this is a campfire on steroids. I mean, as far as bonfires go, this is pretty bitchin'. Yeah, that's true. I personally felt like as in terms of a frat party though, it it didn't exactly uh, light my knickers on fire. As far as traditions lighting a banner on fire, is not what I would call a show stuff. Well, they're they're, they're medical they're medical term. students, so maybe they're a little more <laughs> serious minded. Uh, I'm going to come back to the medical student thing in a minute with the 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 prank gone wrong, which is of course the uh, the favorite of slasher movie tropes. You know, I think pretty much I would say 75 percent of slasher movies start off with a prank gone wrong. Well, one thing that kind of leads to them not being that serious is the um, hats that they make the virgins wear. <laughs> the uh, those weird. Uh, ugh, God, I don't even know. Yeah, it, they are very. It's, it seems like something out of Mad Magazine. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. really seem like reality. Yeah. It seems like so what somebody was told they do in college, right. as opposed to a real thing. Right. Yeah, that's that's that, that's definitely uh, true. That's something you know. Oh, this is all crazy stuff that kids do in college, like planting a dead body in someone's bed. <laughs> Uh, so the girls are on one side giving googly eyes to the guys on the other. Amongst the guys is, is a fellow who who never speaks aloud, and we are told that his name is Kenny. Kenny looks like a cartoon bird who is mm-hmm. wrapped up hastily in a flesh suit, <laughs> uh, and he's apparently going to be honey trapped by, uh, by Alana, who is Jamie Lee Curtis's character. By that, he's going to be led into something he's what he's being told is jamie lee curtis is a sure thing and you're gonna go up to this hastily decorated bedroom surrounded by construction lights (laughs) nothing nothing says romance quite like move over to the right because the left lane is closed for repairs And when I was when I was watching this, my for the first scene, my audio was kind of weird. So all I could hear, I couldn't hear any of the dialogue. All I could hear were the sound effects, and those lights made the loudest clicking noise. So if you ever want to watch it in like a very weird way, just like break your cable to your speakers a little bit. <laughs> um, it was it it was very surreal. So 
Jamie Lee Curtis goes up ahead of him, hides behind a massive bedpost, and then lulls him forward. Force, I wouldn't say forces, but cajoles him into taking off his clothes and getting Wait, can into we, bed. He doesn't take that much. Yeah, and, he, and he's, can I, can I say that he is wearing some disturbingly skimpy panties in this scene? <laughs> they are very, for someone who is, you know, supposed to be very shy and, and, and nerdy, he's got some teeny tiny undies on. And I was very jealous of his thighs. I'm just gonna <laughs> just gonna put it out there. They were they were thin and long and I was like, oh man. Yeah, his legs go all the way up to whatever the hell's on top of them. Uh, not to body shape him, but he was he was hired for his, for a body type. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. We'll get to that more <laughs> later. Uh, unfortunately. So she cajoles him into bed, asks him, kiss me, Kenny, kiss me. He leans down to do so. Now, what we don't know, what we obviously know and Kenny doesn't, is that there seems to be a a prop person in bed, a a mannequin. Oh, no, no, no. It turns out to be a dissected corpse whose arms immediately fall off. (laughs) And then... (laughs) Kenny oh my god this this out. this this meltdown I I it's it's a it's a little over the top uh it's it, a little uh, excuse the top, me uh, the top we passed it's, a it's, long this, time it's this like Douglas Douglas Cirque as spinning in circles while screaming freak out and 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 I love it he he gets himself just tangled up in those filmy curtains and and it's just and and I I really want to know I, I I read an art an interview with the the actor who played Kenny and he mm-hmm. very much thought he was making something artistic here. And, 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 <laughs> and like, especially when you read about, I should post it on our Facebook page because when he goes into all this work he did in developing this character and, and, you know, how he thought why he should react a certain way that he did. So I think this is all his idea. There's this wailing and, and whirling around like Stevie Nicks and, and, and then they, they, they slow it down. So it, so it sounds all the more, you know, bizarre and haunting. And, and I love it so much that I was delighted that they did it twice in this movie. <laughs> I mean, he has a distinct reaction. He just spins and spins and spins in gauze. And I'm sure a young Michael Bay watched this and and just immediately became erect and said, if they just gave him two guns, this would be perfect. (laughs) It is just a whirling dervish. And then everyone else is kind of laughing. But Jamie Lee Curtis is kind of like, oh, this didn't go how I expected. Which like guys. Yeah. What the fuck did she uh, expect? On the other hand, though, he is a medical student, so one would wonder why he. I mean, I understand being surprised or and, and perhaps angry yes. that a dead body has been planted, but he's just acting like this is nothing he's ever seen before, and just uh, just aghast, and and he just his his psyche immediately just just snaps like a twig at the sight of this dead body in front of him. It's like you seen one of these before have you not they're, they're supposed to be in there with i mean theoretically yeah, he's a freshman well, maybe okay so fair, maybe. fair enough maybe not but then uh, clearly he's not gonna he's he's not cut out for medical school he, his psyche is on a slippery slope he is practically insane before he enters this and then goes beyond insane into some other sort of dimension of crazy. Yeah, it's 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 you, you, there's right. no. I mean, I feel like that's almost the high point of the movie, and and it takes a long time to to get back up there. There, there is that is the minor pacing problem that this film has <laughs> is that it it after this uh, let's call it a sex prank again happens that after that there's a, a large lull as we now <coughs> actually meet each of these individuals who participated in the prank itself i mean let's face it the only only characters that really matter uh, are are alana who is the uh the, the final girl and, and doc who is the, mm-hmm. the the real fucking asshole of the uh of, of the 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 story there's always there's always one and oh boy is he a real fucking <laughs> asshole he, he yeah. and it takes way too yeah. long for him for his character to be killed off now it's it's a, it's a satisfying death don't get wrong don't get me wrong albeit <laughs> largely off screen but this character is just like wow 
just he's just scowling and awful and and, and, and in a way that doesn't I mean granted as we as is the point of the podcast they don't really spend a whole lot of time developing these characters so it, it's the audience doesn't get to find out why anybody would want to be friends or you know, spend more than a minute in, in the in this guy's presence and why he has a girlfriend and why he has friends at all but uh, I mean other than that I mean there's really the other characters aren't really around long enough to make any sort of real impression everyone's very quickly isolated well, mo is yeah, yeah. Mo well is yeah mo, important. yeah mo, mo the mo the mitchy is Mitchie? yeah mitchy is Ugh. doc's girlfriend sort of and mo is alana's boyfriend but who goes along pretty much with everything doc tells him to do yeah we're gonna get to a sequence that was when i all of a sudden woke up <laughs> like I, I was like, oh, eh, this, okay, 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 and then those Doc and Mo have a conversation where something is said, and I was like, oh, what, what? Well, uh, now I'm interested in this movie. Okay, that's a teaser. <laughs> but just so that everyone knows who may not be familiar with Terror Train, Doc is played by an actor and director named Hart Bachner. This is basically a movie-long audition for what would become his most famous role in Die Hard. He's the yuppie asshole Ellis in that movie. And this is basically Ellis in medical school before he flunked out and decided to take up finance with Nakatomi. Yeah, that's true. That is his other big role, isn't it? This and, you know, eventually directing PCU. That That is Hart <laughs> Bachner's milieu. <laughs> I've never seen either of those movies. <laughs> you you could Ugh. you could skip PC or you probably <laughs> yeah. should watch Die Hard at some point. I I should watch Die Hard. I yeah, I know. So from this original sex prank again, we then cue the lifetime original movie text of three years later. Three years later. Uh, and we now see a bus full of ex -co graduating college students, but also there's some undergrad this is a whole big frat party just like we saw at the beginning only now it's three years later i was also confused because they're talking about that it's a new year's party which is not the same time as graduation time so i wasn't i the the timing of it was very confusing to yeah, me Yeah, maybe canadian medical students graduate a different way blame it on canada but, yes cool why not <laughs> Listen, the movie doesn't feel important to tell me why should I wonder out loud about that it. That is true. And so we uh, now get a quick body count started, of course, with Jamie Lee Curtis. She starts off in brawless in a pirate shirt. So the movie's got that going for it. Here we got... <laughs> Ed, who's a one-liner machine, and by that I mean he's kind of Ugh. the class clown, but on cocaine. Yeah, he sucks. <laughs> he really, really does. We have Alana's BFF and roomie, Mitchie. Uh, she, I thought she was playing a sort of a monk, but it turns out she's playing a witch, and they should really have thought about maybe making that mask a different color, because <laughs> I couldn't tell the fucking difference. <laughs> Did not know what her costume was at all. <laughs> no. It's slinky and it's black and that's about as much thought as they put into it. Then we have Jackson and he's a guy with, um, he has hair and <laughs> he's wearing a Slithis <laughs> costume. He, Patrick yeah, just, that's about just, it. Patrick just said he's the black guy. Uh, he's <laughs> the black guy. Uh, that's all the characterization he's given. Uh, it's not that he shouldn't have been cast, and it's not that he's not worthy of more. They just don't give him a damn fucking thing he, to he do. He is miraculously not the first character killed, as as is no. as is usually you know, tragically the fate of characters of color in slasher movies. But he, I mean, he's he's near the first, but but not the first. He's first, and there's adjacent. nothing really dislikable about him. Like he's he's fairly likable. Yeah, he's I just thought. a goof, a college goof, and a pretty yeah. bitch, and a pretty bitchin' elaborate Halloween costume. Yeah. For sure. But it's not Halloween, it's New Year's. Well, he probably, he, I mean, if you, if you had a costume like that, I, I, I mean, you'd recycle it for several events. Come on. That, that had to cost, that had to cost some true. cash. And is it New Year's? Like, the timing, I was getting hung up on it. I think it was New Year's, but the costumes don't make sense in that case. Like, I think it was just yeah, some sort, just some sort of masquerade all... party. I, I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, what that I took it sense. as, that it was a masquerade okay. ball sort of situation just on a, 
on a train. Um, I do not know where I got New Year's from. Uh, be- because it's three years after the, the initial incident, okay. which was on New which Year's. Was. That makes so sense. It, That's probably yeah. what it was. Listen, I think your okay. math lines up. <laughs> Don't doubt yourself. Okay. And then we, of course, uh, had the aforementioned David Copperfield, who's the magician. The magician. Although the majority of the time he's playing the angry magician, and he is not ready for prime time the, here. The scowling magician. He's just angry about My... the gig. He's angry about the place. He's angry. Although he's got a lot of production value. There's lights and music fucking going on in that in that train car. That's a lot of production yeah. value for an inside a train car magic show. <laughs> My note about him was that he looks uh he, he looks like an evil Topher Grace. So that was kind of <laughs> I can, I can My, see it. I can see it. My note he, about I him. think that his most of his uh his direction for the character in the script was was stares intently because that's what he does. He he sta- <laughs> he stares <laughs> yeah. a lot, very very intensely. There's if that lot. was asked of him, he delivered. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. He he definitely he definitely uh, fulfilled his role in that regard. We have Alana's aforementioned boyfriend Mo, and he pretty much looks like a wax dummy of a young William Shatner that's been left out in the hot sun too long. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> He has, he's one of those things where he has very thin lips like George uh, W. Bush. <laughs> and when he smiles, the lips disappear and it's just very untrustworthy. He, he also, he, he also has the, the, <laughs> the strongest Canadian accent. Oh, he's sorry. He, he, he he's definitely, sorry about that accent. He definitely he's says sorry. sorry. A lot. Alana, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be upset. I'm so sorry. He has a lot to be sorry about, though. So, oh my to god, be fair. does he ever? <laughs> uh, and then, really, along the offshoots here, we have Oscar winner Ben fucking Johnson from the last picture show. Uh, he's playing Karn, the uh, concerned conductor. The, hero, the, the, uh, he's the, the kind... heroic train conductor, as it turns out. Absolutely. Uh, he's the kind of guy who just wishes you would put a damn radio on this train. <laughs> Meanwhile, is Karn doing it with that secretary the one in the wheelchair yeah no i think they just kind of they're just sort of i think they're just sort know. of you know had that co-worker flirting thing going on i don't dance with a lot of my co-workers that aren't my wife <laughs> he seems he seems so avuncular to me yeah i mean he's just a guy he's just a guy who wants to sit around have endless conversations about the future of railway travel there's nothing i, I think he, oh. I, I think he's oh i think god. he's a good guy oh my god you know for a slasher movie this film features a lot of debates about the future of winnebago's <laughs> versus trains <laughs> it feels like it takes up half the movie it was so so pointless and not interesting it never becomes interesting and no. yet the film was like let's have another conversation about it <laughs> <laughs> we need to pad this out to 88 minutes also on the periphery you have pet who's played by exploitation all-star joy bouchelle she went on to be in movies like quest for fire and humongous And the lady who lounges around Jeff Goldblum's apartment in nothing but a jean jacket and panties in the fly. She's in a lot of Canadian stuff. And she's usually not dressed in much. Is she the one? It, was she the one whose costume was a pair of pants? Yeah, with like with, with like a, a hand. Pants with a yeah, hand that's, I, I, that's yeah. another one. I was like, I was like, huh? What is what is this costume supposed to be? Yeah, I don't know what she's masquerading as necessarily. That's not. A masquerade so much as just a... Is that supposed to represent a barrel? Or is that meant to evoke that there really is a man inside her pants? Oh boy, trying to get out? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's a man in all of our pants trying to get out. (laughs) That's half the fucking problem. Yeah. Um, This movie gets it right away. It gives you one of its most annoying characters and instantly sets him up as terrible you don't want to see him after he opens his mouth the first time and certainly not after he begins to do a terrible roast level (laughs) stand-up routine (laughs) before they even board the fucking train but hey you know what you don't have to worry about Ed too long because he gets a sword right through the fucking gut from the window. Yeah, before go. the train even leaves the station, and absolutely no one notices. Everyone is <laughs> and, and, and this is and this is one of two times in which someone is murdered right in front of like a dozen people. And and and, and yeah. you know, and certainly in the in the second one, 
the, the, the second murder, it's, oh, well, I did something and you didn't notice I was there. It's like, no, someone's going to notice that you're there. You know? I mean, yeah. but, I think, but I love that poor Ed yeah. just collapses onto the tracks and then the train slowly rolls over his head. <laughs> so he rolls over his body. I mean, that's satisfying, actually. Although, if I'm not mistaken, his, his prop blow-up doll does make it onto the train. True. Well, she's important. Uh, she will go on to be vastly important to the plot of this movie, which is strange to say, but true. Um, so, yeah. Uh, R.I.P.D., Ed. I'm glad you're gone. And I like that his safari helmet is crushed before the rest of his body is. That's filmmaking. This movie was made by Roger Spottiswood. This was his first movie, although he'd been an editor for a long time before this. And now the he, this basically sets up one element that will be true for the rest of the movie. And that is the killer then dons the costume of the person that he's just murdered. So we actually have a real mystery-ish in this slasher <laughs> yeah. mystery. Oh, so yeah, and, 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 it, and it allows so a lot of the, 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 oh, it's you trope. Unlike Happy Birthday to Me, where people just say it to a figure off camera and we just see their <laughs> shoes. Like, this posits a world in which someone could uh, be recognizable to other people and you would assume that, hey, you're that person who I saw with that mask on. And as long as they don't say anything out loud, they can kind of get away with it. Or if, so, or if no one notices I, if, that your height has changed or that you've you know, lost or gained 30 pounds in, in, in the space of an hour. Or the or that you're not black anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, you had breasts at one point, now you don't anymore. And, and yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the person who it is is, is, is fairly slight, but, it, you know, that which would make possibly disguising himself as a, as a female more plausible but not probably a a six foot tall man it's right. a little inconsistent but at least it's a concept i can get behind even if it's not entirely successful all the time at least they're <laughs> going for something um so yeah uh the killer dons ed's costume and almost lures mitchy into uh to her doom like almost right away uh, and, but then he quit very quickly uh, sets his sight on Jackson, the guy in the Slithis uh, lizard costume. They then go off into a bathroom and Jackson gets his head pulverized into a mirror almost immediately. I don't know that the killer, I guess psycho strength is what's happening here because Jackson has about 75 pounds on our killer. Typically, yeah. yeah, he he's he's definitely uh, as as weak or as strong as the as the movie requires him to be. Uh, at some times, it's it's hard for him to hold on to the wrists of a rather frail woman. <laughs> Other times, he's uh, strong enough to ram what looks like a a, a NFL linebacker into a mirror. <laughs> Granted, Jackson is drunk, but I don't think he's that drunk. Anyways, blood's everywhere, and Jackson's... I don't think his throat actually gets cut. I i think there's just glass on top of his throat. I can't tell. Yeah, I, I think the getting, I yeah, think the I getting your tell. head smashed into a mirror probably would, would do the trick. That's all it would take for me, frankly. I'm that fragile. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> but what we learn throughout this is that Alana does not like Doc. The, the sex... Frank again that happened really, you know, created a divide in their relationship. But Mo and Doc have a very um what would you call their relationship? Uh doomed, psychologically fraught, possibly romantic. Yeah, wasn't there a point when one of them said, like, you know, I'm here for you if you need anything or whatever, and the other one was like, Yeah, whatever, and the other guy was like, No, I really mean it. <sighs> yes. That's when I like perked very, up. It was like very intense. That's when I was yeah. like, "This movie got really fucking what? interesting to yeah. me." Yeah, was yeah. That's it is. There is an interesting, almost like a, a like a, Doc has has a a psychological hold on on Mo, and and I don't know that it's poor script writing, and they just didn't develop this, or, but I mean, it's he. You Mo meekly goes along with a lot of stuff that 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 that, that <laughs> yeah. Doc tries to get him, and I mean these aren't kids; these are people in their early to mid twenties, 
And you, yeah. yeah, sure. We, I know our girlfriends are right on this train, but let's go pick up these other girls and take them to our cabin. Hey, what they won't know, <laughs> what they don't know, won't hurt them. Oh, okay, Doc, whatever you say. Uh, yeah, it's it's super odd, but they they have such a, a hold on on one another. I guess Doc uses Mo because Mo has money, or it comes from money at the very least, and Mo doesn't have much of a personality, and so he leans on Doc. I guess. Doc is like the taller, handsome one. So like, why wouldn't you just try to be just like? Yeah, but he's him? horrible. True. He he yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's he has not totally a, his his totally sole terrible. redeeming quality is that he's vaguely handsome. Yeah, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> I mean, I, su- <laughs> right? I suppose that gets I mean, people yeah, a long yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I suppose <laughs> it, it, certainly in 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 a, in a movie, yeah, that does take you pretty far. But I mean, just talk about a, a completely irredeemable character in every possible way. Oh yeah. I'm right there with you. There's there's not much to say about him that's super awesome. Uh, and I don't know that I feel all that great about Mo. I mean, to be honest with you, I think they'd be better off with one another because they'd remove each other from the rest of humanity. Because <laughs> when Mo is trying to get back in Alana's good graces, he always asks her questions. And as she starts to answer, he talks over her. <laughs> It's like we're on the manspl- <laughs> Mansplanation Express. Ugh. He's terrible. Yeah. I-, I don't like he's, him. He's I don't bad. like Doc. This frat is full of fucking assholes. As 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 is yeah. par for the course. Let's just face it. Yes, very true. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, total reality. Uh, in between all of this, we get a lot of backstory on Karn about how he wants to get out of the train game. And also, what, um, thinks that people are dummies for not selling Winnebago's. <laughs> and a lot of disco magic. Just tons of disco magic. And is magic tricks! Mm-hmm. I really liked the magic tricks. I really liked them. <laughs> they were really fun. The cigarette going through the corner, like... I mean, usually he... you only see that up close when your cousin who's in fifth grade shows it to you. <laughs> But here you have David fucking Copperfield doing that basic <laughs> magic trick. And this movie had that going for it. It's fun at adjacent least. at the very least. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, it, in the middle of that magic uh, scene when he's on stage, there's a very tight shot of one girl in the audience who has the largest amount of hair I've ever seen on one head. <laughs> and, but you combine that with the hipster glasses that she's wearing, and basically, she is what Paul <laughs> Thomas Anderson has been masturbating to since he was 12. <laughs> How did I miss her? That sounds I, amazing. I wish I had the ability to screen cap as much as I used to. Uh, I will try to get a shot off the television <laughs> to show people, because yes. it, it is magnificent. Like, this is the best background player in any movie that we've covered so far, and that's really saying something. Even better than the the lady with the eye patch in uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh well, <laughs> we. <laughs> She's great though. I want to know her backstory. <laughs> I don't need to know this girl's backstory. So maybe eye patch lady has it going on. You're right. <laughs> You're right again, Gina. What can I say? As always. As always. <laughs> yeah. As always. As always. So yeah, after Jackson gets killed, uh, Karn discovers the body. Then when he goes to alert other people and bring them to it, someone has cleaned up the crime scene. Is is he is 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 the killer kind of messing with Karn? And and if so, why? I don't know if they mean to mess with Karn, or he just always meant to clean up the crime scene. He just had that person just hadn't gotten to it yet, <laughs> and the timing worked out for them. But there was a lot of blood in that bathroom to clean up. And they only find one towel that is splashed slightly with stage blood. So, um, yeah, yeah this character definitely has a uh, a little bit of the uh, ability to to bend time and space, and 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 yes. be in more than one yeah. place and, and at one time. And and I'm I'm also greatly greatly impressed by uh, by his ability to to change out of various outfits. And, and and put on makeup yeah. and remove makeup and 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 apply nail mm-hmm. polish and remove that nail polish over and over and over again. Not to give anything away, but we have ourselves another well, the- little Mrs. Doubtfire situation going on. 
I think the makeup is explainable because he was always wearing a mask. True. So that true is probably explainable. But the nail polish thing—that's a good call on that. I didn't. I didn't really think about about that. But you're totally mm-hmm. right. Yeah, very true. Um, so uh, along this line, there's also a band on one of the train cars. Uh, they don't play a good <laughs> song the entire time. One of- yeah, they they need to. I need to submit them to to Beyond Yacht Rock. <laughs> Uh, they just want your funky love, Gina. That's that's all they want. <laughs> I had to turn on the closed captions to make sure that I got all of the great lyrics of that song. And I did not find any beyond I just want your funky love. <laughs> <laughs> and the the band didn't even register for me until the scene where they have to break the train and everything just goes flying and then i was like oh there's a band this whole time (laughs) that drummer is pretty good at holding on to his drum kit while the train breaks yeah yeah as far as uh star trek uh body acting to what is not really happening that drummer (laughs) is one of the better there was there were actually a couple scenes of of uh, actors moving in strange ways um, on sets that probably were not moving. There was one between Alana and the conductor that they were both kind of like rocking back and forth in sync, and it was it was kind of funny if if you didn't know they were on a train. <laughs> <laughs> it should be noted that Jamie Lee Curtis's character is apparently addicted to peanuts. She spends a <laughs> lot of the time in the movie eating peanuts or trying to get more peanuts. <laughs> it's a very odd affectation, but one I found delightful. Oh, yeah, we get a fun racist diatribe in the middle of the movie. That was a hoot and a holler. Uh, one of the beanie virgins from earlier on uh, later plays a more prominent role here, dressed as an Uncle Sam who goes off on a yeah. anti-Middle East thing that does not cut away and you just hear racist joke after racist joke and i was not pleased by that 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 bit did not age well Mm-mm. no and, and you could tell that he just you know thought he was you know, you know doing his uh his his practice for open mic night oh that open mic should be closed permanently <laughs> yeah but he was one of the virgins from the three years ago because he was wearing that dumb the dumb hat. But he's he's since had sex because he's not wearing the hat anymore. And uh, I interpret it as him having sex. It gave him um, the confidence to become an asshole just like everybody else. <laughs> that would do it. That would certainly do it. That's yeah. It that's unlocked his potential, and thank God we were the cameras were there to <laughs> capture. What um, a relief. Now, Karn also serves a, a, a different purpose, and that is to constantly update us as to the plot machinations of what's happening. He's the person who says aloud so, the stuff that the filmmakers want to make sure the audience knows, like, oh, my God, he could be changing costumes. We wouldn't know <laughs> what he looks like. <laughs> so thanks for that. It's like, in case you're not paying attention, which, no, not not really. <laughs> yeah. What if he switched costumes? What if you were the center of his fury? What if your past is coming back to haunt you? He says it all. <laughs> it's, it's also, I think, a little irresponsible of him to not let everybody know as soon as he realizes there's a killer on board. Because he tries to cover it up and, like, keep everybody calm. For probably a little bit too long, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, we got a, a, um, a mayor from Jaws situation happening here. Yeah, yeah and, and, and where yeah. the hell is this train going? Because it's, because the the, the, the way they are they are they are treating it, it's like out in like the Yukon or something, where where there's just <laughs> no stations they could possibly stop at between you know, where they left and, and and where they're going. This is just like an you know, I mean, is this supposed to be like an overnight? train ride or it's a couple hours because this is there's no possible way they could stop the train anywhere uh yeah i assume that this is kind of some sort of show route that they take it on i'm reminded of uh in wisconsin when we go back for christmas uh they'll do um the sort of christmas train where it takes you from the center of town (laughs) out to one remote part where they put they have a christmas village 
uh, where Santa is, and those are the only two places that train goes. So its oh. only purpose is basically to transport people from the center of Madison out to this shanty town where they uh, they put up a quote unquote Santa. If you believe that. Uh, and then head on back. I assume it's that sort of thing where it's this train is hired out for parties or train demonstrations. And I was just sort of imagining sort of a like a snow piercer situation where it just like can't stop because it's too cold. <laughs> that is also possible. So at one point, <laughs> when knows? everyone is told, when everyone gets off and they start doing a head count, and they're all like, "We're not getting back on the train with a killer," which is a reasonable concern. Yeah. Karn says, there's nowhere to go. You can't walk down from here. You'd freeze to death. And and a lot of people are like, mm, I don't know. I'm wearing tights. I think I could make it. <laughs> tights are warm. Get those fleece lined ones. I, if I were, listen, if I were wearing tights right now, I'd slide right out of them. I'm sweating buckets. Ugh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone was wondering if Jamie Lee Curtis learned how to disco dance better, in between prom night and here, the answer is a firm no. No, no. No. She's still bad at it. Uh, the choreographers, if there was one on here, did not help her any more than the prom night choreographers. It's uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a sad white man's overbite situation yet again. She has many skills, but that is not among them. Bad dancing is very relatable to me, so it didn't even <laughs> register. So Karn believes... That the killer is now wearing Jackson's slithest lizard costume. But Mitchie doesn't know that. And later on, after watching a semi-competent magic uh, uh, demonstration by David Copperfield, who's wearing so much makeup. <laughs> it's in, He is wearing makeup for people in a different train car. Yeah. His, That's how much he his, has on. His yeah. face looks like it's made of suede. <laughs> uh, i wrote down that he basically comes off like a uh, an over intense robbie benson <laughs> yeah he's very intense and, and and as i mentioned before like the 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 movie flirts with that you know this is going to be some sort of romantic interest for jamie lee curtis and and most of it just involves them staring at each other, and, and it's, it's a little disconcerting at times. I mean, she has more chemistry with Karn than she does David She really does! I mean, I mean, it's a little <laughs> fatherly, but, be, but you know, definitely they, they have more of a, a, uh, a rapport with each other. They, they, they speak, which is, which is more than she can accomplish with, with, with David <laughs> Copperfield. But, yes. I, I, you know, I don't know if he... You know, this was supposed to be stunt casting with, with making him this this character, but they they try a lot of different things with him that just do not work. Like initially, they try for a love interest, and then for whatever reason, about halfway through the movie, Jamie Lee Curtis decides, "Oh, it must be him. He must be the killer." Why? Well, <laughs> we don't know. Just this, you know, it, it must be him. Why? Why wouldn't it be him? She carries on a, a yearbook investigation in which we discover that Kenny, the kid involved in the, in the sex prank again, was into magic. And therefore, it must be the magician. Now, if you saw Kenny, the actor who played Kenny, and David Copperfield next to one another, this would be impossible. You would not confuse these two. There's no amount of plastic surgery one could get inside of the insane asylum that we are told he has been uh, booked into that could make Kenny into David Copperfield. But that's what the movie tries to tell <laughs> yeah. us. And only three uh, years has passed, though. So. Yeah, I, I did not buy that for a, a, a hot second. I mean, it's also one of those things where it's like, oh, he was in a magic. It. No one booked the magician onto the train is the other clue that we're given. That just the magician <laughs> just showed up. And there's a lot of lighting and sound stuff that goes into David Copperfield's show for him to just randomly show up on this fucking train. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but none of the movie makes a whole lot of sense. That's so, okay. somebody had somebody uh, had to book him. He showed up and and was yeah. complaining about this 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 gig he had to do on a train, so somebody had to book him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he makes a lady disappear in a very small space. So I'll give him this. 
he puts on a decent train magic show. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Mitchie sees that Doc is trying to make time with Jackson's girlfriend and Pat, and so she. What was her costume? Mitchie's or what, what was she? Jackson's no, girlfriend? No, the. the... Yeah, was she like a thought, ice princess? A or? Cleopatra. I was gonna say I thought she was like a harem, okay. a harem girl okay. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. There's some mixed messages in terms of of what exactly what she's got going what on. historical reference is being made there, but it's like a a genie, a, a Cleopatra, a, a, a one of one we, of we those. did not we did not okay as long as it wasn't something that was like super clear that I just didn't get. It's a sexy um, Cleopatra. What, what, we, what we what we didn't mention <laughs> okay. is that this this character is played by Prince Protege Vanity. <laughs> Gina, you just blew my mind. Are you serious? I, 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 I am. <laughs> I did not find that in my research. That is so. This is the best role she ever played. This is the best she ever acted. <laughs> oh no! Her costume. Now, no, wait a second. I'm looking at her costume right now. There's shells on it. She's supposed to be a mermaid. That okay. oh. oh my god, that really did not register the two other I times I watched shiny. this movie in, in preparation for this podcast. <laughs> uh so there you go. We can't tell what costumes are because they're exceedingly vague. Anyways, uh Mitchie decides, well, if you're gonna get down with vanity, I'm gonna grab Jackson and I'm gonna totally do him in an upper berth. And um, with the with the lizard costume on, apparently. Ugh. Oh my god. I, I'm just not into having sex with somebody in a in a costume with a mask on. That doesn't seem like a good time. A, 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 a rubber costume at that. Yeah, I think the mask is the least of your worries when the costume is made of rubber. <laughs> like, ugh. Like, she does ask him to take the glove off at one point, but but that's. That's it. And still got the rest of it on. Well, she asked him to take the glove off. He does. And the hand is particularly inanimate. Uh, it also <laughs> appears to be the a high melanin count of an African-American gentleman. But it also <laughs> turns out to be a severed hand. And and she says one of my favorite lines in the movie in that scene. She says, cold hands, warm heart. <laughs> and she's like, no. <laughs> That's a lot of wishful thinking uh, going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, uh, once she discovers that is a severed hand, she begins to scream her head off. But luckily for the killer, the train knows when someone is screaming because it always has a train <laughs> whistle go off at the moment someone screams their head off. It's like it's timed or something. Or someone hits a button. <laughs> or just convenient cutting yeah uh we after that that's when we get that really awkward seduction maneuver uh by uh david copperfield on uh, jamie lee curtis that also involves peanuts it's <laughs> <laughs> he, he he knows what a, he knows what a woman likes she likes peanuts <laughs> the way to a woman's heart is a salty snack Especially if you... That's very yeah, true. There's plates of it everywhere, but she still wants it out of a vending machine. It's very... I don't get it at all. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, uh, but uh, Mitchie's uh, throat is slashed. Karn discovers the body. And then he again takes off. Tries to cover it yep. up and then goes <sighs> off somewhere else to do something. But he ends up dragging uh, Alana, Jamie Lee Curtis's uh, character, back to I don't know, ident like she doesn't believe Mitchie could possibly be he dead. Because he has he has he has a shoe. He says, "Whose shoe is this?" Yeah, right? and she says, "That's Mitchie's shoe." Like it's Mitchie's. Where is Mitchie? And then she yeah. goes crazy in the birthing section, just ripping open curtains trying to find it. And uh, our killer has not been able to move Mitchie's body, and her throat has been slashed. And so, yeah, that's when we get our first of what is Gina Radcliffe's favorite thing, Jamie Lee Curtis screaming. <laughs> it's a very good favorite thing. She hates it. 
Yeah, it's oh, I love it. She collapses on the ground, and she's oh, she's so great. She's 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 a little less shrill in this than she was in Prom Night. I will I will give her that. And uh, uh, we also he now that's not the only character that has a really shill scream though. We learn a little bit later on that Doc has one of the craziest screams outside of Reggie the Reckless I've ever heard in a film. (laughs) (laughs) It's really high pitched and it's super, super crazy. Yeah, but it's so nice to hear because he has it coming so bad. Mm -hmm. Doc also manages to discover uh, Mitchie's body. That's when we hear his crazy ass scream. Uh, And he tries to stop the train, but when he hits the brake, nothing happens. Uh, And so that means Karn has to go figure out what the hell happened. It turns out that the conductor and the guy who shovels coal, who is really into some sort of crazy dream where where the future is train driven. I I don't know if he read, uh, not the Fountainhead. What's the one where everyone in the future is traveling? Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged. (laughs) He's got some sort of Atlas Shrugged thing happening. Yeah, he's. Where, yeah, it might be the only slasher movie that has a that has a uh, a John Galt like <laughs> character in it. <laughs> he's so bent on individualism <laughs> that he believes that train travel is the future. It's the dumbest fucking idea in the world. He's just got to invent a special kind of metal, and and then you never know. Yeah, sure, why not? Listen, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it's impossible. I'm just <laughs> gonna say it's very fucking unlikely. Uh, I'm gonna say that Atlas Shrugged is impossible. <laughs> I'll, I'll go that um, far. Uh, so yeah, so Karn finds a bloody conductor hat, and the the then the crew clears the train. They manage to slow it down in the middle of an overpass, and now we're gonna do the responsible fucking thing, and that is get a head count and figure out how many people. In this party are dead. <laughs> Wait, um, did, we, did we skip over? Did we mention Mo yet? I think Mo might oh, still be. No, with Mo, us. Mo's death does portend this. That that's that's okay. when that. My apologies. Uh, that's when Doc Scream <laughs> really comes into play uh, during the magic show. At some point, someone. I, there seems to be one stab wound on his neck, and then it turns out he's slashed in a couple different places. But all this happened in the middle of the magic show, and I am still unsure as to when it happened. Yeah, it's. It, the, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the killer tries to explain it, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it, it also depends on how much the audience would buy that the, that the people watching the magic show are so enraptured with what's happening on stage that they would <laughs> fail to notice in a very small room. I mean, I, I've not been on a, a, a huge like cross country or cross estates train, but I mean, those are pretty tiny little spaces and I'm not sure, you know, short of sawing someone in half, how distracted I would be by a magic show that I would not see someone come out into the audience and murder someone next to me. And the fact that Mo doesn't say anything. Didn't David Copperfield like disappear himself into the audience? Was that when he did that? When do you remember? Oh boy, there is a set. Yeah, he, he like disappeared himself and then popped up in the back of the audience. Yes, there's a, a sequence that's, where that's as th- as he as sits himself of. in a chair and has Vanity put a, a cloak over his head. She counts to seven or something and pulls the sheet off, and he has disappeared. The camera reverses, and he's in the middle of the fucking audience. And everyone's like, what? <laughs> so something yeah, like Yeah, but that. still, I mean, if someone is being murdered right next to you, you're, you're going to notice that. I would think, but, but these people are assholes. He's the world's most preeminent <laughs> magician, so, like, he's very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Well, he's figured out ev- it like Jason knows everyone's uh, you know, sex sitch. David Copperfield knows what you want deep down. Most people want a magic show in front of silvery Halloween decorations and Jamie Lee Curtis likes peanuts. So, he's <laughs> he's dialed in. <laughs> he can read a room. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, we we got we have several people. They're just they're just falling. They're dropping like flies. They stop the train. Everyone starts searching and they start counting heads outside. This is what we get the uh, small revol- the first of many passenger revolts where they're like, "We're I'm not going back on that train." Uh, in the midst of this, Jamie Lee Curtis hunts down Doc and says, "I've figured this out." The person who's killing us is Kenny, the kid we pulled the sex prank again on. He was put into a mental hospital. He had supposedly killed somebody by accident or no. She's very vague on details. And therefore, this crack in his sanity must mean that he has escaped this mental hospital and is killing them off. That's that's the only thing that they have in common. <laughs> and and and, so. and knew about somehow knew about this masquerade party and and when it was going to be and what time he needed to show up for it. Knows a lot of details about it. I mean, th- this plan I couldn't even put on this party, Gina. <laughs> Nevertheless, hear about a party, then come up with a plan to then disguise myself, enter the party, and start knocking off just a group of six or seven people one by one without being noticed. I, this person is a genius when it comes down to it. Well, you know, when, when, you, um, when, you, when, so, when, yeah. when you achieve the, uh, the ability to bend space and time and, and be in two places at once, certainly hearing about a party in advance would not be beyond your capabilities. I mean, she really comes down to it uh, of like, hey, what do we have in common? We both have blow dryer damaged hair. We both have very similar <laughs> screams. We both made Kenny Hampson go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs by making him almost sleep with a dead body. Oh, and that's when Doc goes, he goes nuts. He drags her back into inside the, the train and they lock themselves in a room. I don't even know, understand why oh she goes God. along with this plan. It's the n- she doesn't seem that into it. No, she's but like, she no, also doesn't resist that much. She just kind yeah. of goes. She's so shell shocked. She's just going along with it. And then she leaves, and and he's like knocking the knobs off the doors too, or something. Like he was, he was getting really serious about. Yeah, it. and then and then she eventually leaves, and he's like, "Yeah, all right, I'm just gonna stay here." <laughs> well, he's eliminated almost all of the ways out of the room. And then once he has locked all the doors and made it impossible for anyone to get in from the outside, that's when he goes, oh, I should check these closets. <laughs> <laughs> that's he does this backwards. You check everything before you lock yourself into a room and are unable to get out before you start checking the closets and we get a five minute long scene of him opening things and discovering that they're empty and then opening another thing and then going oh what's on top of the closet oh what's underneath and for a second i thought oh my god gina we're gonna we're gonna get bunked the (laughs) setup was there he's sitting on a couch and i'm like he's gonna get stabbed through that couch we're going to have a get bunked. And <laughs> nope. Nope. We don't get a fucking get bunked. God damn it. This is the third fucking movie in a row where no one gets bunked. And I'm beginning to think it's never going to happen again. <laughs> no, no, I don't no, know if I can go on. No bunking to be had. And we don't even actually get to see his death on screen, which is a huge disappointment. Considering what, what a, a irredeemably awful character this is. No, there's that. This should have payoff. I will agree that he what is we're told happens to him is satisfying in a. I'm glad that he got decapitated, but it would have been nice to actually see it happen. But this movie doesn't have a lot of that. It's there's much more in the Halloween vein of things happen and we just discover bodies after the fact sort of situation. Yeah, that's... We did get to see him be scared for a super long time, which is pretty satisfying. Yeah, to yeah, me. that's a good, that's a good comeuppance. Yeah, um, and uh, but this allows Alana to tell Karn what her belief is, which is the magician must be doing this because Kenny uh, loved magic, and therefore the magician must be involved. 
they pile everyone into one train car with the exception of Alana and lock the magician in the back. <laughs> this this is a I guess a great plan if you're absolutely 100% certain that the magician is actually the killer, but they don't know that. And I think this is when we kind of need to spoil it for people if they don't know who how this killer has accomplished what they've accomplished. Is this the moment we reveal it, Gina? I, I think so, but even when we do reveal it, it, it doesn't it still doesn't uh make a whole lot of sense. You you, you just sort of have to uh it requires a, a, a huge suspension of disbelief uh, to, to figure out how he would do this and how he would move about unseen, unnoticed, ch- constantly changing clothes, again, you know, painting and unpainting fingernails. Uh, <laughs> do, do, you, do you want me to do you want me to say it? Should yes, I, should I make pull, it happen. Should I pull the, the magician's cloth away and reveal the, uh, <laughs> the sleight of hand? Uh, yes, uh, reveal that rabbit. Kenny has disguised himself as not the magician, but the magician's assistant. Ooh. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Fuck this movie, <laughs> God damn it! I liked it up until this point. <laughs> like, it's not the best thing in the world, but I'm like, okay, this is all right. I, you know, sure. There's the weird, you had a bad experience with sex and that drives you to be a killer. And I'm not a big fan of that, but... It was the 80s. This was what they determined in their minds was true. This is why do we have to have a crossdresser again? Yeah, be the, the killer. The same the same year as Dress to Kill. Let, let's uh let's point out the the uh the movie that that thankfully at least put the first nail in the coffin of the psycho cross ki- cross killer trope. Not not soon yes. enough, but it did. Um I mean, the only the funny thing is, I don't think that this character, in particular when he's disguised as the the magician's assistant, is ever shot anywhere from except from from a distance. So, I mean, you... no, no, no. He has a scene where he talks. Yeah, that's they when it became painfully obvious what was happening here. Oh, right, right, right. You're right. Okay, yeah. Kenny yeah, yeah. has a conversation with the magician where. When everyone else is outside, they're finally let back onto the train. <laughs> Kenny wanders back in and, and we start to go, why is his assistant's voice so processed? It it, it sounds like a, a Britney Spears song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they fed it through several computers uh, and it is not fooling anybody. And that was when it's, it very quickly dawned on me. I, I will give it this. If the idea here is that this is supposed to be an illusion, the she, Kenny has fooled everyone with this illusion. Uh, okay, but it's not devoid of the same gross transphobic politics that yeah. Mar and Psycho is you know its own bag of tricks. But Dressed to Kill is another one where the, the third time is a real strikeout for me, and. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, this is, I, I wasn't a fan, man. <laughs> it's a real bummer <laughs> that this is what, the direction that they chose to go in. Yeah, I mean, if they just made him the magician, that would have been fine. <laughs> I mean, not David Copperfield necessarily, but but it was just, this is just such a, a bizarre twist on a, on, on a, I mean, I guess they felt they needed to make it stand out because up to that point, it was just a very pat revenge you know for a prank gone wrong type of movie yes well if we had a happy birthday to me sitch happening where someone yanked off a mission impossible mask i would be more accepting of it but this is a straight up uh not to put too fine a point on it cross-dressing uh display and that's where it seems very doubtful once the camera gets close and then it makes it even worse it, we we don't have a Victor Victoria thing going happening here. <laughs> Kenny could not be less likely to be a medical student or someone who sleeps with dead bodies or a, mag- a female magician's assistant. He's just unbelievable in every single role he's cast here. Outside of the twirling, <laughs> he's very believable as a twirler. 
Well, well, here's the th- this is the problem that I have with this movie, and it, for the most part, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was you know it's, it's silly and, and and entertaining, but this is w- would you agree, Patrick and Kara, that his revenge really does not suit no. the crime. It, it's a little over the top. Um, I mean, and, and he comes up with something so elaborate and, and just a plan that is just so complicated for, I mean, it's it's a little bit, I mean, I, I would we keep comparing it to prom night. I mean, in prom night, someone died, which is, you know, that the, you that this yeah. was revenge for, you know, the, the killer's sister being killed as a child. This was a shitty prank. And and not only did he spend years, evidently, coming up with this this you know, hatching this this really insanely intricate plan, he eventually just starts killing people that have nothing to do with it, which which doesn't really put the audience on the side of the killer seeking revenge. I mean, again, the person the only person that really has it coming is Doc. I mean, the, all the yes. other the, the other characters, you know, their crime was just kind of standing around and laughing, and and you know, Alana, you know, immediately showed you know, remorse for what she did. So I'm not sure why he particularly seems to to have it out for her. And it's you know, it's it's a little it's a it's a little much. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're 100 percent correct there. Uh, I he just I think there's part of him that takes the entire group as part and parcel. They all participated, and so they all have to be punished. I'm not saying that's correct, and I'm not saying it's believable, and it certainly does not come off as equatable to what's going on. But, yeah. (sighs) And they did kind of try to explain just, like, why why he would be doing this by giving him the or giving them the like throwaway line that was like he killed somebody when he was a kid and it might have been an accident but like he's crazy so they did they did talk a little bit about how he's not mentally stable but i mean i don't yeah it it was it was kind of gross there at the end for me yeah. So from this moment on, what we basically have is a third act chase. It's a cat and mouser. So uh, Alana now knows that something is up. She has been isolated in a part of the train that we has been closed off for years so much so that everyone has to apologize for the dust that we never see. Uh, it's clean, but it's dusty. I was yes. like, what? Uh, She's being protected by uh, a porter who ends up getting a semi get bunked because he's sitting in a chair and gets a sword through the chest and it kind of goes through the chair. But <laughs> uh, again, it, it's a stretch to call it a get bunked. But this makes her vulnerable. And then we get a very long, long chase of her going from one end of the train car <laughs> to the other. <laughs> being chased by a killer that no one else can see and no one else can touch. He gets thrown off the train at one point and manages to stick on because he's fucking <laughs> Spider-Man or something. Uh, yeah. It, it, we She does find the body of, of David Copperfield and he's been, he also has been sorted to death inside of his um, pincushion box. box. I can't remember what that magic trick is I think called. it's just called like the human pincushion or something I, like that. Pff- I think you're right. Eventually, Alana uh, makes it. <laughs> There's a very weird thing where the killer is wearing a mask for the majority of this. And Kenny has an intimidation technique, which is to grab something and <laughs> shake it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not um, frightening to me. It seems to be very frightening to Jamie Lee Curtis's character, but did it frighten either of you when he grabs a, a flimsy uh, a bunk bed and, and, and shakes it a little? No, because no. He, he, he's, he's a very small man. He he's looks really like small. he looks like he's about five foot six and maybe a buck forty. Yeah. I mean, I, I am not a, a particularly strong woman, but I could totally fucking take him. I mean, it's just yeah. you, he, he, yeah. just, he just needs to have something thrown at him, and I think that that, that would you know, that that would 
do the trick. He's not yeah. a he's not a physically imposing character in the slightest. He looks like he's about fifteen years old, and and <laughs> you know he's he's. You, he does look like someone who would. I mean, I mean, I hate to say this. He looks like someone who would do drag, and and I and mean, in, I, and indeed, yeah. the, the the actor. Like I said, I read this interview, this very extensive interview with this actor, mostly about this this role, and he was a drag performer, and and he was brought in to to add this, you know, to to make this character believable, and and. But he, in, as himself, he's just not, he's not scary. He's not intimidating. And it's just, I, I feel like the shaking thing is, you know, well, we got to make him do, we got to make him look, make him do something that makes him look at least a little bit scary. And it was not working. <laughs> I think, I think I read that same interview and didn't, didn't he say like, he wasn't even auditioning. He was like, they're bringing his like partner into audition yeah and then they offered him the role that was that was funny yeah and and it's he, he said all kinds of crazy stuff in this interview like that he yeah it was kind of unreadable yeah like he claimed that at some point like he was supposed to the character was supposed to have had an affair with the conductor and i'm like and oh, i'm boy. and i was reading I'm like mm, what <laughs> it's like <laughs> when would when, when would this have happened but yeah i i've got to dig that up and, and post it in the, on the group when when the yeah, facebook page because it's he really is very very proud of this role <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't want to take that away from him but uh he the movie kind of takes it away from him so it it does yeah it does um this element of surprise thing has worked out for him so far but uh, jamie lee curtis is able to turn the tables and we told you that that blow up doll would come into handy later on because she uses it as a double for herself (laughs) <laughs> um and that's when she gets the jump on on kenny uh that begins the cat and mouse chase uh she then ends up in the sort of uh conductor's quarters uh and <laughs> this is where we get the bed shaking and she they lock themselves in slowly by eliminate by locking doors to the point where she is trapped inside of this cage that he can very easily stick a, a Flintstone style crowbar through, <laughs> through at multiple times. It's just, it's not the best place to hide. Let's put it no. that way. And finally, finally, he uses this crowbar to pry open the lock that she's managed to, to lock herself into. She has stabbed him several times at this point. She's put a, uh, a sword into his kidney basically she's slashed his hands uh he's slashed her chest and arms and hands they're very slippery the two of them it's just all blood <laughs> all upper, upper torso damage for the most part um and uh he manages to, to pry open the cage door and that's when alana stabs him in the face with one of those things you put orders on like a yeah oh the little spike the the little order spike yeah yes in the face i think it's like straight in the eyeball too wasn't it it's in the cheek it's face damage and i I don't react well to face damage no it's not not good Mm, no it's this is the one vicious part of the movie where it actually feels like People they they show violence as it happens, and that that is more effective than the bunk bed shaking that occurred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. But uh, they continue to tussle, uh, between the cars, and that's when she manages to sort of kick him off with her pirate boot, and he he sticks to the side like a human fly. <laughs> He then crawls down backwards like he's Michael fucking Myers <laughs> uh, back into this car. Um, and uh, but no, the the luckily Karn has come to our rescue with a giant coal shovel. And at some point of uh, the train car has opened up a side panel and he manages <laughs> to knock him through the opening and. They just so happened to be traveling over a bridge at the time. Luckily was, for us. It was kind of unceremonious at the very end there. It was like a little bit 
like I felt a little bad for Kenny at the end. Well, there. yeah, because I mean he's pretty much down for the count at that yeah. point, and and Karn is coming into this fight fresh. Nothing yeah. bad has happened to him in the entirety of the movie, other than you know maybe his employer isn't going to be happy with his performance, <laughs> and so he just comes in and pounds the fuck out of Kenny twice, and he flies out this the side of the train and into the icy depths several stories below and then we get a, a good 45 seconds of watching his body go downstream i was gonna say yeah we get we get a nice he gets a nice little float away yeah. sequence um at one point kenny asks uh, alana to kiss him and that is very awkward Ugh. and he has another freak out i love it so much yeah we- oh, <laughs> that's right that's what he has twirled a thon number two <laughs> we we get bookend freak outs no no unfortunately no filmy curtains to to <laughs> get himself tangled up in <laughs> yeah it's 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 through this freak out that that's when karn is alerted to the point where he can sneak in and, and whack him a few times with that that cold uh shovel so that's that's terror train people uh any, any final oh, thoughts boy. Um, you know, I, I hadn't thought of this movie in years and, and having watched it, I, I can see why. I, I can see why it kind of disappeared into the, the recesses of my mind, you know, in one of those, you know, everybody has, you know, a bunch of movies that they recall having seen at some point, but could not, uh, could not tell you anything about it. Like, I did not remember going in this the, the the twist in it um i mean all i could basically remember well it takes place on a train which you know obviously the title tells you that but uh i mm. mean it's i it seems to me that it was sort of one of the 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 lesser slasher movies i mean again i was it was enjoyable you know the the glaringly ugly and clumsy twist in it but you know it's it's very much follows the tropes of you know the the the, the nice girl you know the the kind of you know, irredeemable asshole and, and you know the the various you know, faceless colorless people who who get quick get kick, quickly killed off which again is why our podcast exists um would i say it's a must watch in the genre no not not really it's so I, close to being to being good and i thought it was pretty fun <laughs> You should, don't <laughs> listen. Don't let. Uh, we're very jaded here. Yeah, I think maybe it's because like I don't know. I, I haven't seen as many horror movies as you guys, so like the tropes don't feel as old to me. Like I'm definitely like okay, I can see everything that's coming from a mile away. Like I definitely understand this movie, but also like the costumes were really fun, and that they're on a train is really fun. And that they're just having this big party and kind of the sort of self-contained nature of it was just kind of kind of nice until, you know, the end when I was like, no, please don't. Why would why would you do that? (laughs) Why would you ruin it? You're doing so well. Uh, the the fact that it's a train that they can't really s- stop and get off yeah. many places that they're sort of trapped on this thing that has to keep going so that they can get to safety. I like that element of it. I also like the costumes, but the the fact that it refuses to show violence in the moment until that final yeah. cat and mouse, I think yeah. holds it back a little bit. And that twist is just kind of on the unforgivable end unfortunately yeah. I, it just it's something i did not remember about it <laughs> until i committed to it it's kind of like the main thing like i feel yeah. like it's like basically the whole thing is that it was kenny yeah so it it's come so close to being a genuine mystery that i wish they had just done one or two more things to make it really pop and i think then the lack of gore in the moment would have been forgivable. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. It's just not as clever as I want it to be. But you know, it, it's certainly it's better than prom night yes. by yeah, it is definitely good five hundred percent. I mean, at least with at least with this, there was only one red herring, which was which was David True. Copperfield. Right. Which whereas in prom night, everybody was a red herring. Everyone's a red herring, and yet no one is. That's the beauty of <laughs> prom night. It tries really hard and fails really hard at being a red herring factory. 
Uh, so yeah, that brings us to once again everyone's favorite frat game, Choose Your Own Death Venture, and that's Yay. when we decide of all the deaths presented in Terror Train, if we were forced to die that way, uh, what would we choose and why? So Kira, as our guest, I turn to you first. What say you? Oh boy. Um, so none of them are great because I'm terrified of death and I don't want to think about it. But we're not thrilled about death to... either. But <laughs> right. that's not the point of the game. <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, I would have to go with Mo, um, because he is he gets to die. I mean, they're all basically stabbed, so his seems relatively quick-ish. Um, it, it must have. By... It, it must have been. He apparently did right. not utter a sound. He didn't utter a sound, but then they pull him off, and and everybody's like, "Mo, Mo, are you gonna live?" And he doesn't. So I think he doesn't fully die right away, but he's he's definitely like out pretty quick. Um, he's watching a sweet magic show before he dies, so that's fun, I guess. Um, and it's just yeah, it's it's quick, and he's surrounded by people that he likes. He's also like drunk, so that might make it a little easier. So, yeah, definitely Mo. Okay. Uh, Gina, uh, what item up for bid have you decided upon? Um, I was initially going to say that I would take Ed's way out because I, I, I am I am a jokester. I, I like telling jokes. <laughs> and I can definitely see you know, being murdered before I even make it onto the train because that is absolutely something that would happen to me. But on the other hand, I don't want to be slowly run over by a train, even if I happen to already be dead by that point. So I, I think mm -hmm. that I'm going to have to go with the magician's way out, just stuffed in a box and, and ran through with, with swords because that, that's it's kind of a cool way to be found when you think about it. True. That's true. In terms of the cool ways to be found, the magician's probably the best. Uh, I am going to go with Doc's decapitation um, because it happens quickly. It happens off camera and he's wearing a very comfortable monk's cloak <laughs> and it's very breathable. And uh, I feel that it would be loose and I wouldn't be confined. He's, he, he's probably so... not wearing pants under under that. Oh, no. No, Doc doesn't wear pants under that. Sure. Come on. He's totally 100% freeballing. <laughs> That's how I personally uh, always wear my monk clothes with sans underwear. Well, you're just hanging around the house in your uh, in your in your 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 monk's vestments. Yes. I mean, he's got he's got a lot of ladies, so he's got to be ready to, you know, take it off really fast. <laughs> or I he guess. just hikes it up. I don't I don't know. Yeah, like a there 50s you go, prom exactly. date. Yeah. That's super that's, convenient. That's just oh, that's just God. time efficient when you think about it. <laughs> there you go. Plus if if he gets caught by his girlfriend, it's easier. Hey, he's to, a busy he's a busy medical you know. student. He he does not have time to remove pants. <laughs> yeah, especially when he considers it's 1980, so pants are very tight back then. Oh, extremely you know, tight. Exactly. So that that's that's you know, that's that's giving you a couple extra minutes that you just don't need in your life. That's right. Exactly. Uh, so that pretty much does it for Terror Train. Hey, Kara, uh, where can people uh, hear more from you? Yeah, I host a podcast called Fun Dip and Cherry Coke. Um, it's every two weeks now, at least for a little bit while I settle into a new job in a new city that I'm living in. Um, you can find us on Twitter, Fun Dip Pod, um, all the social medias. It's basically the same. Excellent. Do it today. Hey, Gina, where can people yeah. find out more about you on the internets? I write about 70s and 80s television at tuneintonight.wordpress.com. Do it today, people. Hey, you want to say something to us? There's a couple pretty easy ways to do it. Reach out to us on Instagram, Kill by Kill Podcast. Uh, we do fun things on there uh, when I remember. Uh, I used to do a lot more fun things, but um, Apple's operating system now does not allow me to do <laughs> screenshots. So that took a lot of qu uh, arrows out of my quiver. I apologize. Uh, so I do what I can, people. Uh, on Twitter, at KillByKillPod, or have something longer to say to us, uh, KillByKillPod at 
gmail.com. And if you would be ever so kind, well, why don't you rate and review us on iTunes? It helps us find more people like yourselves. It makes us more popular. We rise up the charts. We, we take over the world and we bring you with us. And there's another way that we're going to help you out. If you have a favorite kill in the Friday the 13th series or even Terror Train, let us know and we will read it on air uh, for everyone to hear. That's our solemn promise to you, the Kill by Kill listener. Don't worry, folks. The body count continues. Happy Halloween. We will see you in a little bit as we resume Friday the 13th, part eight. Jason takes uh, Vancouver. Um, <laughs> It, uh, it is a real interesting go. Uh, we missed you terribly, Gina, on our on our last outing. Aww. But we will have you back for the next one. Uh, and hopefully forever on afterwards. I never, as, as much fun as I had uh, with our guests there, and I certainly did, you were missed terribly. I You helped make this podcast wonderful, and I, I could not have a better podcasting partner Aww. in the world. Well, I, I sat I, I sat at home listening to, to Mad World over and over again, thinking about how much I missed recording that episode. <laughs> you should have t- taken that time and and uh, been on the podcast with us. Well, I was in I was in Michigan. I could not. <laughs> oh well, I, I could not hide in the hotel room bathroom. The acoustics okay. are just all wrong for that. Oh, that's true. And and Michigan, that just practically impossible to record inside. Yeah, do they do they even have internet there? I don't know. I you that's they just moved past two cans and a string, but they did have lots of fago, so that was uh, <laughs> I, I just you know, after that I'm just I'm never leaving my house again. There you so go. You, you, you won't you won't miss out on another episode with me. Excellent. All right. Well, for Gina and for Kara and myself, bye bye everybody. The body count will continue. Bye bye. Kill by Kills produced by We Write Good and is intended for entertainment purposes only. Friday the 13th is owned by Paramount Pictures. Jason is owned by New Line Cinema. No infringement is intended. Kill by Kill logo was designed by Josh Hollis. Visit him at joshhollis.com. The Kill by Kill theme was created exclusively for us by Revenge Body. Get the whole track and much, much more at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com today.